So my name is Garth Ratliff, and it's my pleasure to introduce <coughs> Mr. James McSherry, who's going to do our, <coughs> our Zoom session this evening. And he's going to talk about the NHS at 70. The NHS was 70 <laughs> years old in 2018. Uh, and James is part of a project that's looking in to do research into the social history of the NHS, the social history of the NHS. And this project is organised by uh, Manchester University and is paid for by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And it's of interest to all of us because it's collecting data and information about people's live experiences of the NHS. And uh, the project is, is under some pressure because, of course, many people who've uh, experienced the NHS are in the 80s and 90s, and their stories have got to be captured as, as soon as possible. Now, I'm personally fascinated by how on earth uh, James and his colleagues will have, uh, first of all, collected all this data and uh, analysed and tried to make some sense of it. And... Uh, the reason is because in the West Salt Mortal History Group, several of our members have been interviewing um, older residents of West Salt who have fascinating stories uh, about their experience of the cotton industry and the mining industry. And th these are just, there's no attempt to collate these. These are just sort of uh, lovely, isolated uh, interviews, really. So uh, I'll pass you over to James. And there will be, I think, plenty of time at the back end for us to add that the, the project does invite contributions from people, but you're certainly welcome to uh, engage in your experiences at the end of James's uh, presentation. OK, over to you, James. OK, right, well, thank you for inviting me over this evening. Uh, my name's James McSharry, as Gareth said. I'm the Public Engagement and Oral Histories Coordinator on the project. And I thought um, I would come over this evening and talk to you a little bit about the project NHS at 70 and play you some clips of the material that we've collected. Uh, then to talk a little bit about how we responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, which kind of, it potentially jeopardised the project uh, because we could no longer do interviews face to face, but we managed to work around that and have continued to collect uh, interviews about COVID-19 over the last year and a half. And uh, I'd like to finish off by playing you a few extracts of some of the material that we've collected during the pandemic. And then at the end, if anybody's got any questions, I'll be happy to field them and answer them uh, the best I can. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd use a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to share that with you now. So the NHF, uh, NHS at 70, Stories of Our Lives. Uh, the project uh, ran between uh, July 2017 and 2020. That was its kind of lifespan. It was a three-year oral history project. Uh, it had a funding value of £1.5 million pounds, and £900,000 grant of that came from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We worked in 10 localities uh, around the UK um, and we worked with, recruited and um, trained up to 160 volunteers. Mm. Uh, the main aims of the project was to create, or is to create, a diverse and shared social history of the NHS. Oh, I just need to move this little box out of the way. Uh, to stimulate engagement and debate on the NHS past, its present and its future, and to create a legacy in the form of a digital archive that will provide a permanent resource for NHS history. And I can say that that uh, home is going to be the uh, uh, British Library. So the archive, when we bring it to uh, a close in January 2021, all the interviews will be uh, accessioned into the British Library where they will be uh, publicly available for, to everybody for research and education and uh, inquiry for the future. 
the National Lottery Heritage Fund has a certain sort of criteria that's quite kind of key to uh, what we do. So uh, we were very keen to have community engagement. This kind of research is kind of a little bit upside down in terms of traditional research, whereas normally people will do some kind of research and then present it to people. Whereas we went out there to engage with the community, to engage with people, get them to contribute to the archive and they become the archive. And from there, we can then sort of like draw conclusions and uh, data. Um, we uh, used volunteers very strongly within the uh, project. And we have uh, a website, because we're a digital archive, we don't have a building, we don't have a library, we don't have a, a physical space in which you can come to, but we do have a website uh, that you can visit uh, to find out more about what we do. Um, that website will be listed at the, uh, on the screen at the end of this presentation. Uh, we also did have a travelling exhibition, uh, which was due to travel to 10 localities throughout the UK. UK. Uh, we did start off, uh, we did exhibit in Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool. We then moved on to Altrincham Library. We were on our way to um, Nottingham when uh, we got the call to say the university was closing due to the Covid pandemic, so we had to draw the uh, uh, travelling exhibition. And then the main key part of this um, project and its uh, legacy is the digital oral history, which will be a permanent record of people's uh, experiences of the NHS and the COVID-19 pandemic. Volunteers have been a really crucial part of what we've done. So we've um, recruited over 160 uh, people who have volunteered with us to, uh, you know, uh, record, learn how to do oral histories and uh, record oral histories for us. Obviously, people, it's quite transient, so people come and people go, but we do have a core um, uh, hub of volunteers who have still stayed with us and are still recording today. Uh, so we certainly have a couple who are, well, certainly one uh, of our volunteers is here tonight, Alex, uh, who has been with us since 2019 and has spent the entire pandemic interviewing people remotely on the telephone. So, um, Volunteers are really, really important to help us to do the work, not only to do the recordings, but volunteers are the gatekeepers to their community. So, for example, I hope you don't mind me picking on you, Alex, but uh, because, Alex is, uh, because of Alex's involvement, our archive has a very rich Bolton accent to it, because obviously people draw on their friends and their colleagues and so uh, Alex has, has spent a lot of time interviewing a lot of uh, ex-colleagues from um, Bolton Hospital and people he knows throughout the area. So that's a really important way for us to get regional uh, flavours and regional accents, you know, uh, built into the uh, archive. So um, I thought what I'd do now is to um, play a few extracts from uh, different uh, interviews that we collected before the pandemic, talking about people's different experiences of the NHS. Uh, I've picked several um, interviews here just to show the different aspects, the different threads. Some people are patients, some people remember the NHS as a child, some people recall the days before the NHS. Um, people who work in it, uh, all manner of different people, because ultimately everybody has a NHS story. If they, you know they're born or live within the UK at some point or other, you will engage with it. So the first example is Andrea Kane Acres. And Andrea was born in 1957 in Caffili District Miners Hospital. And she remembers her interactions with the NHS as a child, including queuing for the smallpox vaccine and speaks of local feeling following the, the arrival of a new Indian doctor to the GP surgery throughout the 1960s. And sometimes the receptionist would come out into the surgery and say, if people don't want to wait because there's an hour or two hours to wait to see any of the other three GPs, you don't have to wait. You can go and be seen straight away by the Indian doctor nobody would move. People prefer to wait the two hours to see a white GP rather than see the Indian. And it was quite incredible because he stayed in the practice and many, many years later, he actually became the senior partner in that practice. And he 
was one of the most loved GPs in that practice and of course completely integrated um, and he only died last year and I went to his funeral and to just see the love and affection for that GP it was just amazing to see how things have changed and how he was embraced that diversity eventually became embraced it was fab that's a bit of testimony from uh, Andrea. I, obviously, I'm not going to play the entire interviews to you because they, they can be several hours long. So that's just a little extract from Andrea's uh, interview. The next person I'd like to introduce to you, this is Philip Crosser. And Philip was born in Tredegar in 1939, the birthplace of Nye Bevan, uh, and where he describes healthcare before the NHS through the Tredegar Workmen's Medical Aid Society. He received treatment for a club foot from a top orthopaedic surgeon. Oh, Philip there back in 2000, uh, 2018, I believe. I was born in the, the Royal Oak pub in Dukestown, and I was born with club feet. At the time, um, my father was paying into the Medical Aid Society so I was taken then to one of the top orthopaedic doctors in Wales, Nathan Rockin Jones, and that was the start of my treatment for quite a few years. And then after when the NHS came in in 1948, I was sort of transferred over to the NHS. Um, my last operation, slight operation, was when I was 18 years of age, which was in the Royal Gwent Hospital in Newport. And... Um, since then, I played sport and done all those things, but I do get trouble now, which which is natural, with what, what was happening in the beginning. But uh, from then on, it, it went okay. Thanks for that. You mentioned uh, about um, pre-NHS medical aid. Just for people who might not understand who's listening to this, could you explain what medical aid was? Right. Well, the medical aid in Tredegia at the time was... Uh, if your father or any of the family, they were paying into the medical aid at that time, you were entitled to all the free things that were going on. If you if you want to be taken to Newport or taken to Bristol, they'd pay for you to go. It was exactly the same as when the NHS came in in 1948. We already had it in Tredegar before that. You know, people, as long as they paid in their contributions, they were allowed to have glasses, uh, teeth taken out, you know, this was it. Uh, my next uh, extract is from Jonathan Blake. Uh, Jonathan was born in Birmingham in 1949. And he talks about uh, the NHS having cared for him as a child. And in particular, he talks about uh, the care he's had uh, and experiences he's had uh, since his 1982 HIV diagnosis. So, in your early adult life, um, throughout the 70s, did you have any kind of, um, any need for uh, NHS uh, uh, treatment? or Constantly. You know, yeah. I was in and out of the clap clinic, you know, so, so, and they were pretty grim. I mean, I tell you, they were always in the basement of hospitals. Can you explain, sort of like, describe to us what they were like? Oh, well, you know, um, basically, sort of, you know, uh, you were considered a kind of sort of a modern day leper in terms of, you know, if you'd got sort of um, gonorrhea, syphilis, you know, you really were sort of, you were unclean, you were really not a fit member of society, whether male or female, so it didn't matter, but, you know, even more so because, you know, people were still only getting their heads around the fact that sort of homosexuality could be tolerated. Can, so, can I just clarify, now, was that that attitude, was that sort of like the general public or was that sort of like the professional medical staff? Um, I think who, it was, I think it was the general, it was the, 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 the general public and it fed into medical staff. So, you know, there, there were always sort of um, um, issues around and particularly around gay men. Um, and sort of uh, and venereal disease um, and you know basically the sort of you know if it wasn't for sort of Afro-Caribbean women 
you know, the NHS would very probably have collapsed. So they were sort of, you know, the mainstay of the of the nursing staff. And whilst, you know, they were great, they had a lot of difficulty around homosexual men. Um, in terms of, you know, they had sincere Christian beliefs and homosexuality was, you know, beyond the pale. So it was difficult. Um, and it's not like kind of one feeling, you know, as a, as a white man that it was sort of, it was racially motivated. It absolutely wasn't. It was religiously motivated and it was a difficulty and it was a barrier. So the next uh, extract is Sarah Coughlin. Uh, we met Sarah in Liverpool. Uh, she was born in 1983. Sarah describes living with acquired dystonia, which is a neurological condition caused by damage to the basal ganglia. She explains how she contracted it as a result of an injury to the head whilst at work. Um, she actually uh, in, in, was working in a children's nursery and one of the children threw a bottle at her head, which hit her head, which uh, then kind of brought the, uh, the injury on. But this is what Sarah has to say. How's this, how's this impacted on your life? I mean, you, you must have had a you know, as a young woman, had a vision of what your future would be. Yeah, I was very, I had a couple of jobs. I was very work motivated, home motivated, holiday motivated. And I used to do like carnivals and things like that and dance. And, um, but it has changed like the group of friends I had and everything. Cause obviously I don't go clubbing or anything now. Cause obviously you can't get a wheelchair down a flight of stairs into like the clubs. Um, <laughs> I'll still go out with a new group of friends, but I do find I lost quite a lot of people. Friendship circles after the accident. Um, but in another way, I look at it positive because I've met a lot of new people since the accident as well. And I do different things now to what I used to do. So I think I do look at it all positively, even though it's happened. I've got a sort of new look on life now. So like I'll go to the gym a couple of times a week and I'll draw at home and I'll come like the brain charity to do different like spray painting classes and things like that. So it's been good to meet a variety of new people. That was Sarah. So that's just a few examples of uh, some of the uh, types of interviews we were collecting uh, for NHS at 70. Uh, at that point, we would always go to people's homes or to uh, hospitals or wherever, and we would always conduct the interviews face to face because that's kind of the traditional way in which you do oral histories. So obviously we get to around what, March 2020 and the messages were to stay home, protect our NHS and save lives. So March uh, 2020, uh, 16th of March, the British government advised uh, uh, to avoid all but essential contact to contain the spread of COVID-19. The 17th of March 2020, the University of Manchester closes campus and suspends all face-to-face -face activity, rendering our projects potentially in some kind of crisis. 23rd of March 2020, Prime Minister Boris Johnson instructs UK to stay home, protect our NHS and save lives. And by the 25th of March 2020, uh, NHS Voices of COVID-19 had conducted its first remote interview. So just to give you, set the scene really, the picture, um, we, uh, the university closed and suspended all remote, uh, all face-to-face -face interviews. So we kind of thought, what do we do? Should we kind of like just sit back and wait and go back and interview people once things have calmed down? But we didn't know how long that was going to last. I don't think any of us realised that this could have lasted as long as it has. So we decided to push forward. We got permission from the university to record interviews remotely over the telephone. We then had to, had to try and work out how do you do that. So that spent quite a lot of time on the internet, internet looking for cables and wires, but we managed to work out how to do it. And uh, so by the end of March, we were ourselves for the project and the volunteers that were coming with us were set up with, mic with earpieces and cables for telephones, and we were ready to start recording off the telephone. So, and that's where we moved our focus from NHS 
in its entirety to NHS and COVID-19, which is what we've been doing uh, since March 2020 and continue to do right up until now today. So I've just got a little film piece here I'd like to show you, which kind of demonstrates the kind of work we were doing and how it slightly differs from what we were doing before. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this project. Um, so my first question is, what is your first memory of uh, the virus? I suppose it was it going back to when it, when it first started being talked about from China, but then it just seemed to happen really quickly. March just seemed to be an absolute roller coaster. It seemed to be changing by the hour with what things were happening. Gosh, it was back in January, I think, when I saw um, a news report about Wuhan. And to be honest, I didn't pay much attention. It was kind of because it was the other side of the world, you know. I sort of, it came up as a news item, but didn't really, at that point, think much about it. I think I really underestimated it. I just thought we had, you know, there's a few funny chest infections around in China. And the number of um, kind of epidemics that, re that break out that don't make it to the UK, well, it's much higher than the ones that do. So you kind of think, that's another one we can watch from afar, like, and it's only over, yeah, as the weeks went on and we, we started to talk about it more in hospital and then people started saying, well, if it makes it to Scotland, we will have to do this. And if it makes it to our hospital, then we'll have to use this room specifically. And if, it was all very hypothetical. And like, if we get one case, if we get two cases, and then it suddenly became a, hmm, this is, oh, it's not an if, but it's a when. And it's not, are we going to get one or two cases? It's, you know, where are we going to put the hundreds of people that are coming in with this? I mean, I think we were just last day as, as British people because it may not come here. But as soon as it came here, then it was, are we prepared? And were we ever prepared? Um, we were certainly, it, we're going into the unknown because we don't know what COVID-19 is all about and how it may affect um, people as well. And for, certainly from my perspective, it was seeing the volume of black and ethnic minorities people dying from this virus, um, which was startling. So um, that's just a little example. You'll notice in some of those early recordings, the uh, recordings will differ from the earlier ones in the fact that you quite clearly, obviously, there is a telephone aspect to them. You can tell there's that kind of distance. But that in, it, in itself kind of like reflects the circumstances we were all in. It was impossible to uh, go out and meet face to face. So it was the the right way to, 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 to conduct interviews safely. And I think adds another layer, actually. Uh, we did try very hard to get the sound quality as good as possible, but I think under the circumstances, it just kind of like, it adds to the story. Equally, uh, the NHS at 70 project was always, always due to come to an end by uh, July 2020. Uh, but by that point, we were in, right in the middle of the pandemic and it just felt like we couldn't stop at that point. So uh, at that point, the UKRA Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, you know, granted us more funding to continue the work and we are scheduled to continue up until January 2022. 
Um, the, it's a unique situation. Oral history is traditionally done face to face, um, and uh, but in these circumstances, we felt it was the right thing to do to switch to telephones. We have gathered so much information, so much kind of like uh, experience, people's feelings and emotions uh, throughout this pandemic that we would have lost had we have waited till uh, lockdowns have been lifted. So, uh, you know, I personally am a big champion of the fact that we did it right in the moment. Oral histories are traditionally ref, uh, ref, uh, reflects on the past. So uh, normally uh, in any kind of oral history project, you'll go to somebody and ask them to respond or reflect on something that's already happened. Whereas in this situation, we weren't sure, we certainly didn't know what the outcome was. We were, it was changing moment by moment. So it's a very unique set of data. And the interviewer and the interviewee are both experiencing the pandemic at the same time both in their own unique ways, but in some ways it's quite a nice leveler because they have a shared kind of like, uh, you know, uh, knowledge of or, or, ex or experience that was going on, albeit they might have been having a different experience, but there was a common, a common thread throughout. So it's a very unique uh, archive. So we currently have over 1,800 recorded oral history interviews. Uh, we've had 1,300 interviewees participate between 2017 and the present. We have longitudinal um, interviews in the fact that we've got many interviews with people who did an interview before COVID and then one during COVID. So we've got that compare and contrast. And we've got at least 100 interviewees who have been contributing uh, uh, interviews with us on a monthly basis all the way through the pandemic. So for the last 14, 15, 16 months. Again, I know Alex, you've been uh, particularly sort of like um, busy doing those series. So they are gonna show people's journey The, 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 the uncertainty, it's going to be an absolute unique set of data uh, for um, people to access in the future. So I'd like now to just play you a few extracts of uh, some interviews we have collected throughout COVID. I've tried to use quite a widespread of people. Um, so you can just hear kind of like from different people, the different kind of experiences they were having whilst we were all having a lockdown experience. So the first person is Natalie Parr. Natalie was born in 1975 in Coventry. In 1977, and 90, yeah, 1997, sorry, she qualified to become a teacher working with children with severe disabilities. In 2002, age 25, she was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome a rare condition in which the body immune system attacks nerve cells in the perifer peripheral nerve system. I've met Natalie before the lockdown and did an interview with her for NH at 70. Uh, Natalie's a really remarkably positive uh, lady. She is paralyzed from the chest down. She is tube fed and she relies on 24 hour sort of medical care uh, and social care for all her needs. And uh, this is an extract of uh, she gave us uh, earlier on in the COVID pandemic. I can get it to work. The hospital phoned me and said, we're going to start this now because it's quite urgent. We want to start it, but I've got to have a GP come and do an examination beforehand. So I didn't know how, what would happen with that because I'm shielded. I can't go to the GP surgery. So a GP came out in full PPE, which was really strange, absolutely lovely. It was quite an intimate examination, but it, it was kept at a, a distance and it was a really bizarre experience, but it was done so, I felt really safe. She came in the house, she didn't touch anything, she, was, she got a PPE on, she came in, they had no paperwork or anything, and it's all very different, but very efficient. Um, did what she needed to do and went. But it was quite strange having somebody in the house. I mean, we're used to having lots of nurses and people in the house, but it did feel, oh, wow. Oh, it, it was quite a strange feeling that you just thought, gosh, you need to, you have to. But it was, you know, we'd like opened up our bubble, if you like. It, it was quite a weird feeling.
Uh, the next um, extract I've got, I haven't got a photograph of Lynn, unfortunately, but Lynn Patterson uh, was born in Glasgow in 1974. Lynn is a nurse um, returned to work in an ICU during the first phase of COVID-19. And this extract is particularly kind of moving, actually, where she talks about uh, working in ICU throughout COVID and sort of like end of life and people maybe not being able to be with their loved ones at, the, at that point. And I think what's, what's the hardest thing from us as a nursing point is we're always told you nurse, you hold the elderly gentleman who had no family with him. He was unconscious. Um, and we, we took a, 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 a deck phone into the room and the son said goodbye over the phone. That's 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 not right. Do you know what I mean? The, the family should be there holding a hand and supporting them. Mm. And we're watching the gentleman deteriorate over the next half hour. And I was like, I'm just going to go in and sit with him because you can't leave somebody to hang on their own. And the staff were like, you can't. Then I went into the room, I did a full PPE and I was totally protecting myself, protecting my family. The gentleman passed away like about five minutes after I went into the room without his family around about him. That's draining for a nurse because you want to provide the best care that you can for these patients. These wee souls were dying with a stranger holding their hand or in some cases nobody holding their hand. The next extract is Nanette Miller. Nanette Miller is, uh, was born in Crewe, and while studying, she worked part-time as a care assistant in a council residential home for learning disabled adults. After her graduation, uh, she became a key worker, an individual key worker, and after a spell in London campaigning for MENCAP, she moved back north seven years ago as chief executive of Neural Support which was rebranded six years ago as the Brain Charity, and that's based in the centre of Liverpool. How felt to have done this interview with me this morning? Um, I, it's just really good, isn't it, to sort of take stock and have a think about where you are in all of this chaos. Um, things have been moving so quickly, my head's been spinning, so uh, it's nice to get asked the big questions because it helps you think about where you are and where you're going and uh, yeah and, and just puts things into perspective doesn't it yeah it's good Helen Barlow uh, is a director of nursing for Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnerships and Helen is also a, a vaccine volunteer at the weekends um, working on this project I have to say I'm quite shameless so when I went into Altrigo to have my first uh, vaccine jab, uh, Helen was the lady who administered it to me and I got her to agree to do an interview with us. And I'm really glad to, uh, I did. So I asked Helen about why she'd agreed to, you know, sign up as a volunteer. What motivated you to come forward to volunteer for the vaccination programme? So, so I think that anyone in the public sector, James, um, would and is doing what I've done. We all step up to the mark when needed. Um, and like them, I just wanted to help yeah, because COVID's like nothing we've ever seen in our careers. So I approached my local primary care trust and offered to be a volunteer vaccinator. Um, and uh, I was welcomed, you know, I felt so supported. Um, and I'd done all my training online and then you're signed off as, as competent, you know, and as a nurse, you've obviously got those competencies anyway. Um, so I tend to volunteer every Saturday and do a clinic on a Saturday because that fits in with my day job as well. Um, and it's lovely because there's current GPs, retired GPs, practice nurses, uh, a couple of surgeons I've worked with in the past, all pulling together to vaccinate our population. Um, and it, it's a, it just feels like a real um, community response to what's going on. You know, we're all just doing our bit. I'll just read this for you. In partnership with the British Library, we're creating a unique national archive of personal testimonies that captures the complex social dimensions of this crisis. The archive will be preserved uh, at the British Library as a permanent public resource and will contribute to the knowledge of further health, future health pandemics. In contrast to the 1918 flu pandemic, we aim to leave an important historical footprint and a legacy that consists of diverse voices, experiences and opinions. 
And uh, in terms of what I'd hope for the um, archive, uh, I couldn't have put it better myself than this gentleman who is called o uh, yeah, Owen Thomas, and he uh, works for a charity uh, called Future Men. And I asked him what he thought uh, we should do with the archive, and this was his response. No, I just, I just really hope that um, the record is utilised and used in the way that it should be. That my voice is one of, I'm sure, from what you know, our brief conversations before we've done the interview, you, you've managed to reach out to a myriad of people to a broad church of British society, and I think it's really important, as I said at the beginning, that it doesn't just sit there gathering dust. That it's utilised and turned into tools and resources that help people whether that be through history lessons in school, whether that be through prof um, continued professional development and training of NHS staff and social care staff. It's important that politicians listen and, and hear these accounts of what happened um, and that uh, uh, we don't lose the kind of the, the, the knowledge. No, I just, I just really hope that um, Sorry, the record is utilised and used So NHS Voices of COVID-19, we are still um, um, uh, interviewing at the moment. Um, we do have some gaps in our uh, archives. So if anybody is, knows of anybody who knows any doctors, receptionists, dentists, dental hygienists, we'd very much like to hear from them to make sure that those kind of voices are represented in our archive. We'd also would very much still like to hear from people who have worked in nursing homes, care homes, people who have had loved ones, who have loved ones living in nursing home and care homes, who were separated from them throughout the pandemic. If you're aware of any of the, any people who come under these categories, who you think might have a story to tell, who might would like to have their story recorded and saved for future generations, then we'd love to hear from them. Uh, my details are on the screen there. Um, James Manchari at manchester.ac.uk. Uh, the telephone number's there. And don't forget, do visit our website, which is nhs70.org.uk. Uh, Garth speaking to Jim. Uh, did, <laughs> is it possible to come to any conclusions from this massive, massive study? <laughs> Where do you start? <laughs> you know, that's a very, very good question. And... In all honesty, um, because we're still doing the collecting, yeah. that work hasn't, that's the next project, yeah. really, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's kind of like, we've been so busy capturing the data in real time, um, that, um, which is absolutely essential and, and the, the right thing to do. But in, in order to make sense of it, in order to analyze it, to compare, contrast, looking at this issue against that issue, that's probably going to be work that's yet to happen. That's kind yeah, of- yeah. I understand that, yes. I thought, as, I, as you said before, most research studies start off with specific aims and objectives, you know what you're targeting. Whereas Absolutely. here, you just uh, have an enormous volume of information and at the end, you, you, you're left with trying to make some sense out of it. Absolutely, we are kind very, of, in terms of, in terms of a research project, we're kind of upside down. You're absolutely yeah. right that normally you have a question That's right. that you kind of look for the answers to that. Whereas yeah. this, we yeah. collected the question, the questions, if you like, yeah. or the experiences. Mm. And it's there now for people to go back and utilize that. Mm. Mm. But as it said earlier on, in sort of in terms of the Spanish flu pandemic, there was very little documented about it. So we know quite very little about it. So we wanted to ensure that that wasn't the case. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But good question. Hi, James. Can I just ask, um, ha ha have you been managed to get much uh, information from, you know, the minorities in the country, the people who come in as immigrants or the people who English is not their first language? Have you been able to, to capture much experience from those groups? It's a very good question, uh, Hilary. Um, we have in some instances 
um, in like in any kind of like uh, uh, research project, there are uh, communities that are harder to reach than others. And obviously, sort of like if English isn't a first language, that is a barrier. Now, uh, throughout NHS at 70, we did use translators in certain instances. So we have done that. Primarily, we did it in South Wales with Welsh-speaking people, uh, but, uh, but there are other examples. And where we have issues, where, or where we have gaps, where we haven't got representations from certain groups or minorities, what we have done is then sort of like engage with uh, community leaders who have then given us insight to what's going on for certain sort of sections of the society. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of, they could speak on, uh, on behalf of those communities. But yeah, we do have some, not as much as we'd like. we would certainly in the next six months, we'll be actively targeting those gaps to make sure that we have a fully cohesive um, uh, archive. But um, where we've not had those voices, we have managed to engage with group leaders, community leaders, in, in, in particular, Owen Thomas, who just made the final um, statement there. He is, uh, he works for a charity called Future Men, uh, and he is the Future Fathers uh, program leader. So he deal, works alongside disengaged youths, um, people, you know, who are experiencing health inequalities, poverty, uh, dis, you know, people who are disenfranchised. So he could people like him can give us a good reflection on what's going on for those communities that we've not managed to get hold of yet. Because obviously we can't get every single person. No, but, no, no, no. That's a great no. question, thank you. It's good to hear that because obviously there, is, there are a lot of stories there and uh, it is part of the whole experience, isn't it, that we've all experienced. So particularly some communities have, have not, or, or appear not to have, gone along with the majority so it, you know it's good that their thoughts too oh, absolutely yeah we want every opinion regardless you know when I do an interview what I think about the opinion is neither here nor there you know it's about I'm just there to facilitate that person to give their opinion because we want the broadest breath so we can understand mm -hmm. it yes yeah. uh, having got any interviews of um people who've been in hospital with COVID and recovered. Oh yes, Low, many, many, many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. All those, all those were quite interesting. Their stories would be uh, quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that's the right yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, we've got done many, many people who have been in ICU, who was on, um, you know, uh, people who maybe weren't on breathing apparatus, some were, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, people talking about sort of like, have, you know, you know, uh, having the last rites via a digital Zoom yeah. from, uh, you know, a chaplain, uh, yeah. and then about returning home and the effects of long COVID. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's, that's really what I was on. Yeah. We've got quite a lot of uh, yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah. Popped <clears throat> up there from Patricia. Do you, are you on? on uh, have you got sound, Patricia? Yes. That's, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Right. Now, after 1945, 45, 46, 47, those sorts of years, mm -hmm. several other countries in Europe followed our lead of the idea of a, a free health system where everyone was included. And Germany was certainly one of them. And they almost imported our uh, ideas about a, a national health system wholesale yeah. and I wonder if someone on your project could look at how they've changed slightly because they, they have made variations mainly on the funding side of uh, the health system but um, certain things that they have done many people have told me are better than the British system uh, you know, English people who've lived in Germany for a time and experienced their, their uh, health systems. And I would have thought it might be interesting to see how they've tackled this. Um, I know they've messed up the uh, uh, vaccination programme wholesale and there's been great, a great uh, deal of fuss about that. But uh, their basic health system, which is still 
uh, free uh, point of uh, need, um, the funding for it comes through uh, a different system to uh, the taxation system that we use. Yeah. I wonder if uh, there's any likelihood of you comparing it to their experiences. Well, it'd be a fascinating study, wouldn't it? To sort of, if you look at two models that start largely the same and watch how they kind of like grow and grow together and move apart and compare and contrast what work better than others. I mean, it'd be a fascinating study. To be honest, it's not something we will do within this project simply because we've got so much to do in this one here now. But for future, um, for, for future funding streams and future kind of like uh, research projects, it'll be fascinating, a really fascinating thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Have you, in, please can I ask, have you encountered any anti-vaxxers yet and taken that idea on board? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, um, maybe, couple of weeks ago I did uh, an interview with somebody who uh, had very much strong views on that um, which you know, which I'm really really pleased we got for the archive uh, and as I said earlier on when I'm doing the interview it's um, it's really important that I'm not there to judge or offer my my opinions neither here nor there in this kind of scenario I'm there just to facilitate them uh, uh, to have their say because I think it's important it needs to be in there so that we can deal with everything as a whole so yes we have they've not been they've been they've certainly not been as you know there's not as many as there are sort of like the other way the obviously you know people are hesitant and maybe don't but there are some people who have got like you know pitched their uh, flag and said no this is what I think and I want you to know that and uh, we've caught it yeah mm. Yeah, Jane. Also, I've just noticed. Is it Jane Mill? I've just noticed that you were interviewed um, just before COVID. Is that right? Yeah. Who did you do? You know who you were interviewed? Is it with Alex? No, it was a lady. She lived in South Manchester, and she came up to Bolton for it. All oh, right. Okay. Jane, maybe Jane Hampton. Maybe. Uh, I can't remember now. Anyway, uh, don't worry. But well, thank you very much. Firstly, yeah. for taking part in the uh, project and. Uh, if you wanted to, we'd happily come back and do you a second one to see sort of like how you're feeling about everything uh, after the COVID. But, oh, uh, you know, yeah. Have a think about it. We, we'd happily do that. We okay. could do it over the phone to make sure it's safe. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it was very interesting. It was, I, I think I was one of the, the first ones that were practicing on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go after this. I'll go back and I'll have a listen to it. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> Hmm. James, I'm, I'm interested in how you've actually chosen the people and the subjects that you talked about. I mean, was there a, a strategic plan that you wanted to capture or uh, how, how did it come about? And now you've got the recordings, is there any way of sort of indexing them so that you can look up somebody who's had a leg amputated versus somebody who's had a knee replacement or something? Uh, all valid questions, yeah. In answer to your question, oh, when we first started, um, uh, we, uh, there was three of us. Uh, and uh, we, the HLF at the time, the Heritage Lottery Fund said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you this little bit of money and show us what you can do. And then we'll, we might give you the full grant. So uh, I was assigned South Wales and my colleague Angela was assigned Manchester. And it was a case of go and find people, go and tell. So I literally got on a train, went to uh, South Wales and went to Cardiff and uh, started knocking on doors and uh, so literally to begin with there was no strategic focus as to who we wanted to talk to literally I was you know I'd stand and talk to anybody and you know that's kind of how it how it how it started as uh, the NHS at 70 kind of like evolved and we got the full funding and we moved into the 10 kind of uh, localities so we were based in we have people based in Wales in Liverpool in Manchester in Bolton in Newcastle Northern Ireland Glasgow you know Bath um, and the, the aim was that this the, the kind of like the, the if someone would talk to us uh, about an NHS experience we were happy to talk to them that's absolutely fine uh, and you know it was the right thing to do 
as time kind of moved on, we could see like patterns, like we really, really did really well with nurses. There's, it was very clear that sort of like women were far more happy to talk to us than men were. So things like nurses, we really very quickly got a really good solid grounding in that. Um, so um, where else did we get really good? Uh, there were various different kind of areas where people really bought into it. Uh, but then equally, we could identify, oh, we're, like, we're really lacking in surgeons here, or we realised we didn't have, because we want the whole NHS story, we wanted the porters, we wanted the, the volunteers, we wanted, you know, the cleaners, we, you know, all the, the people that make the NHS work, you know, that make a hospital run. Um, so we probably, yeah, we did then become more strategic. We, once we'd identified where our gaps were, then we were more strategic about aiming to fill those gaps. Again, equally, once COVID hit uh, and everything, all the, the, everything got thrown up in the air, uh, it was back to we'll, we'll talk to anybody, you know, you know, because everybody in the country was having a COVID experience, so therefore that that was a that that's relevant. To, we want to know about that. And again, um, we we we. We, we, we just went full belt for about a good six months, probably to the event last November, where we stopped and did an audit again of what we had and what we've not got. Mm -hmm. And again, we saw patterns and trends and, uh, you know, where we were getting really great evidence from this group of people. But then equally, we could sort of spot, well, we've got some sort of gaps here, you know. So from that point on, so like now we're, we're a lot more focused. Like I said at the end of this pitch, like, uh, if anybody does know of anybody who's interested to point, who works in a care home, has a, a loved one in a care home, or anything around that narrative, we really, you know, we really want it. So um, to begin with, the idea was, if you want to talk to me, I'll come and talk to you and happily do it. And, uh, you know, and every recording that we got is a really valuable jewel that makes up part of the archive. Um, but then we got a little bit more strategic later on, when we could identify where, where, where were we falling down, or, or not falling down, but your know, voices that we needed to fold uh, fold in. Uh, and in terms of uh, a bit like uh, the question where Gareth asked earlier on, sort of making sense of this data and analysing this data, um, that's kind of probably the next phase. That's going to be the next piece of work. That's going to be the next kind of like project, if you like, um, how we mine it. You know, how do we? Uh, you know, what aspects of it do we want to look at? What do we want to compare and contrast? Do we want to use it in terms of policy making? Do we want to use it in terms of health and well-being? Do we want to use it for social cohesion? Do we want to use it for mental health for people to sort of like re make sense of what's happened so that they can re-engage with wider society and move on and move forward? So there's all these different ways we can use it, but we've probably not yet made that decision. Of, 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 of the direction that we should go. But all of those directions would be valid, but obviously, you know, we're going to have to choose one or, you know, depending on funding and, and staffing and, uh, you know, uh, capacity. Uh, how are you going to make sure that people know about your archive? Oh, that's very good. Very again, very good point. Uh, the uh, British Library, uh, who are going to uh, accession the archive, will market it. Will you know really promote it heavily? Uh, and again, when we're talking about the next phase of work, all oh, this is very funding dependent. That will be uh, part of that. Will be about making people aware this exists. Come and utilize it. Come and have a look. Come and see what this says. What does this mean? Um, there will be a strong sort of like strand about sort of like highlighting that this this thing this 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 research jewel exists. Yeah, and again, obviously, we do have the website, and we are we do sit under Manchester University, so the university uh, uh, again will will sort of like promote and push us uh, yeah. to the forefront throughout you know academia and beyond. Mm. And uh, sorry, hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations for this am amazing project. Um, has the journalists not contact you? Because they always, especially at the beginning, they need to put faces and to make uh, the, this thing that was happening to all of us, make it real. And they use uh, a, lo a lot of uh, like mm -hmm, testimonies. 
And I'm sure that with the time passing, they are going to go back again to these testimonies because it's really a treasure, because it's, it's the first time that we are really making history. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good point, and I, I hope that it will be utilised by uh, journalists uh, because this is authentic first-hand testimony. You can't argue with it. It was recorded in the moment. Um, and as I said, when we switch to telephone uh, recording, you can probably hear in the tone of something, like you can hear it's a telephone, but we always actively try to get the recording quality as good as possible, because the, the hope is that it will be absolutely mined by the BBC and media, and basically so that these stories can be, because there's, Having done all this work, there'll be no point in, in this work if it just sits in a digital shelf at the back of the a, a back of a, a museum. There's no point, you know. It has to be absolutely disseminated as far and wide as possible. So, um, you know, I welcome sort of like the media to come and sort of, you know, journalist media uh, to come and ask us to utilise it because it is a public, uh, you know, it's a public resource and we want it used. So let's hope so. Yeah. In terms of comparisons, I just want to say that I experience the NHS in England and the health system in Spain. It's completely different. And you have something that for me, it's really a treasure. And it's the volunteer programs all over uh, different, all different parts of the system that there is always uh, volunteers engagement. And that creates an special engagement with the society. And that's really, really a treasure that you have. It's really, really important. I, I find it fascinating. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I agree. I think this kind of like the volunteer sort of aspect of the NHS is an absolute, it's, that gives it an absolute solid grounding because those people are there for the love and the want and the belief in it. And so they're not going to be sweat, you know what I mean? And so that, that's quite special. Yeah, you can't buy that. Yeah. Mm. I was interested that you, um, when you listed the places where you work, you sort of said Manchester and Cardiff and Glasgow and so on. It basically sounded like a list of cities. And I wondered if you thought about going to the very small rural situations. Now, the, the sort of example I've got is we've got some friends that we knew from when we first got married who now live in a small village outside Cardiff. And they were in a situation that they've got one GP who the, the practice there was a single GP in a single building. And he wanted to retire and move away. And I think there was some issue about the pharmacy was in the same building and he was going to go with him or something. And so the, there were some issues around the fact that he was the only person in the village mm. who was the GP. And there wasn't a, a logical way of somebody coming in and taking over. So, I mean, yeah. a, I think there's a sort of story there of those kind of type of communities that might be very different. Oh, absolutely, completely, and completely agree. As, you know, and when I say, obviously, because in terms of sort of like logistics and funding and staffing, you know, you, it's not finite. So we, we tried to do the spread as, as evenly as we could. But certainly when I was based in, I say I was based in Cardiff, I mean, I was, I, that, that's kind of where I sort of like position myself. But then I was up in Tredega and Carmarthen and Cumbran, uh, you know, as far, well, you know, uh, I would go as far and wide as we could because obviously the experience of somebody's uh, NHS experience in the middle of Cardiff is going to be very different than it is sort of like in the far reaches of sort of like um, Carmarthen or Cumbran or wherever. So you're absolutely right. <laughs> and as best as we could, we did aim to, uh, you know, accommodate that. And one of the if you can say what are the positives of the uh, pandemic or the lockdown situation for us has meant that, because um, obviously if I was to do an interview uh, pre-pandemic, if it was in Cumbran or wherever, I would, I mean, I live here in Manchester, South Manchester, I would get a train from Manchester to South to uh, Cardiff and then a train out to wherever I needed to be and then a bus or a taxi. To the, so, you know, to do the interview, that was a day's work. Whereas with the lockdown and going to remote interviews, I mean, I've been able to do two and three a day. And it also means that that kind of access uh, or, you know, um, if someone's more remote, it doesn't matter as long as they've got a decent form line that I can ring them on, I can get that interview. So uh, the lockdown from the pandemic has actually given us maybe in some ways a broader reach. 
but it's a it's a great point and and of course you know uh somebody in the outer hebrides its experiences of healthcare it's gonna be very different yeah. than somebody who's, who's sat in the middle of edinburgh yeah mm. alex have you got anything to say <laughs> <laughs> i'm hoarse <laughs> alex your microphone uh, yeah, yes yes i have i'm, I'm here um, oh, yeah. It's quite an interesting contrast between the research that the local history group have been doing um, in, in and around uh, West Horton mm. and the oral history project from the university, because I know that Garth and others have been trawling through um, paper archives um, at, uh, at Bolton Museum and, and, and what have you, other other pieces of work. And, um, and it's, uh, and, it, and it's, and it's, based on what someone thought ought to be recorded um, at that time. Whereas the um, oral history project is actually um, actually recording people's uh, views and personal testimonies of their experiences of living through these, these uh, well, quite life-changing experiences. You know, the way that the NHS was formed, but the way that the pandemic has actually gripped this country for the past 18, 20 months and, and continues to change it. Mm. So, yeah. so it's quite it's quite a different style. That's 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 my reflection. Yeah, yeah no, quite. You're absolutely right. I mean, again, going back to what Gareth was saying earlier on, that a lot of time with academic research, the um, the leader who the leader of the of the investigator has their question that they want answering, and then they will look for people to answer that question. We're not asking any question really, about other than what's your experience of this, and so uh, it's quite yeah. It's, so it, it's going to create a much richer, broader more honest uh, 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 collection of data for the future, which, uh, but yeah, at the moment, so far we haven't, because we're still in it really, so we've not actually begun to mine it in any great form. I remember reading that uh, someone said that history is written by the winners, and, um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, uh, and it's, uh, and, and, but for this, this is the everyday people who have actually lived through the experience and it's their testimonies which are being recorded in this project. Yeah. So it's quite, quite a unique style. And hopefully yeah. it will make things better for future generations. So this is like our contribution to make um, the UK a better place to live. Yeah. So yeah. long as those decision makers um, use it uh, in, the, in the best way. So maybe our focus now is to, um, as someone said, um, make people aware of this rich archive of, of information and use it for making decisions for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I think one of the things that I always loved about the NHS at 70 project right from the beginning, and it kind of follows what you're saying there, Alex, was that uh, in terms of NHS history, well, it's all, it was all been written, but it was always written by the great and the good. I mean, there was plenty documented about what politicians thought, what lords and ladies thought, but nobody ever asked Huey, the man who does the sheets uh, in uh, Trafford Hospital, or, you know, do you know what I mean? And so, and, and that was what I love about this project is it, it democratized the kind of like process. Yeah. I mean, we weren't looking for the opinion of the great and the good. We know what that is. It's well, it's well written. Um, it's it's the everyman's voice. So it's social history at its roots. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. Are there any more questions for James? Well, I think this has been absolutely fantastic uh, presentation and the. The, the research topic has been unbelievably challenging. I've never come across anything remotely like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you certainly are to be congratulated for tackling it in the first place. Oh, um, yeah. I think in actual fact, this is the history of the survivors, not the great <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for giving us such a, an enlightening uh, presentation. Could you, you all heard. please... Uh, Show your appreciation by giving uh, James a hand clap. 
I know you're very, very welcome. Thank you for listening to me. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Uh, so our next Zoom session is on Thursday, the 12th of August. Um, so uh, that's the next uh, Zoom session. And I've, I've scribbled it down in my diary, maybe not correctly. A grand day out coach trip from Horwich in 1800. I, that, that doesn't quite make sense. It probably means uh, horse drawn us. <laughs> doesn't quite make sense that they were. Uh, Garth, the speaker for that uh, session is sitting next to me. Right. Yeah, I was just going to say Eddie Forker. Have I got the title correct or not? I think it's a bit incorrect, but I'd have right. to go and have a look at it. Uh, yeah. It's basically to do with the birth of the, the railways in Horridge uh. and how it drew people from all the surrounding communities, including West Horton. Yeah. And, uh, how, how they... They went about things, and yeah. uh, they had a, their first picnic of a, a group of Freemasons, oh, uh, yeah. and they went in horse-drawn carriages to somewhere yeah. near Ormskirk, to oh. some fancy mansion. Yeah. So it, it's quite, I think it's quite interesting, uh, but remains to see what you think about it. Well, thank you very much for your explanation. Just yeah. while I'm on, and, and seeing how controlling yeah. the button, I'd like yeah. to thank James for his presentation. Yeah. And I have also been interviewed quite a lot by Alex during the NHS at 70. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very interested in the sheer volume of the work. And I don't underestimate the analysis process. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how uh, it could be perhaps harnessed by universities, perhaps offering MAs in history research. <laughs> on the topic. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, once students have got an MA analysing it from many different universities, mm. perhaps some PhDs being sponsored, yeah. combining the research of the MAs. Yeah, good thinking. Yeah. It's a very good idea. I will put that to Stephanie. She might just take it off you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. why not? Good idea. It is a good idea. Yeah, yeah I, I think the analysis is beyond sort of one individual, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just overwhelming. There's a million and one questions to be mined from it. You know, it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank okay. you.